This morning, we are continuing in our look at some of the parables that Jesus told to his disciples and to the people who were around him. And this morning, we're going to look at a parable which is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. So first of all this morning, I'd like to just take a moment to read this parable, and then we'll discuss a little bit about the background, the meaning of the parable, and how it applies to us today. So Matthew chapter 25, looking at verses 14 through 30. That's found on page 961 in our English Bibles, page 961. The parable of the talents. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money. To another, two talents, and to another, one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of these servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then... The man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant! So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him, and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw the worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The 
parable of the talents is a story of a man and his servants. A businessman who had a lot of property, who had a lot of money. And he distributed the money between three different men. A talent, one talent, was about 20 years income, if you want to think in modern terms. It was, it was 20 years of what the average person would make. A talent was a lot of money. It was a life savings, a single talent. The work of a lifetime. And, of course, when the master came back after a long time, he had an accounting. He asked each of his managers to show what they had done with the money he had left them. Each servant was called individually to account for how they had used the money they had been given. And two of the servants returned a profit. They had used the money and invested the money in different ways and wise ways. And they had more to return. Each had doubled the investment. The man with five presented ten back. The man with two returned four. The third man made excuses. <laughs> well, you know, you're a you're a you're a hard businessman. You're you're ruthless. I know that you're always looking for profit anywhere and everywhere and and I was afraid to risk your money because are any investments 100% safe? No. Right? No investment is 100% safe. There's always some risk. Every investment has risk. And so the man said, I was afraid of risking your money. I didn't want to lose it, so I buried it in the ground. And it's safe. Every penny. Here you go. The master, of course, was not happy. Because... If you put money in the ground for 20 years, if you don't put the money even in the bank, what happens to the value of money? We have what's called inflation, right? <laughs> Cost of living. Sometimes it's very small in some countries. Very low inflation rate, 1%. But over... 20 years, that adds up. 20 years, 1% a year, that adds up. It's more than 20%. It's, it's compounded. Maybe a 25, 30, 35% loss in the value of that money. And so when you're making investments, you want something that has a higher rate of return than the inflation rate in your country or in your situation. Or your investment won't bring you any profit in the long run. The value of money. So the master was not happy, naturally, with the second man. The first two men he commended. He rewarded. The last man he chastised, he criticized, and he fired him. He threw him out. He lost the talent that he had. He was expelled. He was cut. This was a story that the people listening to could understand and relate to. Jesus told a lot of parables about managers and stewards, and this was one of the most famous. And in this parable, of course, the manager, the owner, the man who possessed all of these talents, all of this wealth, was a symbol of 
Who? It was a symbol of Christ, of God. And each of the managers working for him were symbols of followers of Christ. People that professed to, to listen, to obey, and to follow Christ. And the talents, or the money that each person was given, represented the resources that each person was given by God. And there are many kinds of resources that we can have, and we'll talk a little more about that a little later. But people do not all have the same resources. Some people have a lot, and to some people have very, very little. Some people God has given many gifts, and other people God has chosen to give few. But in the story, God, when He called each of these believers and each of these followers to account, he expected them to do more <laughs> with what they were given. Each was expected to, to use and to build and to expand and to grow in the time God gave them. God did not set a level for all of the people. Each believer was held to a different standard. When the man with five talents presented five, the master was happy. He gave him more, he returned more. To, who, to the person God gives much, much is expected. To the man who had two talents, the master did not say, well, why don't you have five like this guy? <laughs> This guy gave me five, he only gave me two. What's the problem? That's not what the master said. The man who was given less, less was expected of him. And the master was satisfied with what he had done with those two talents. And to the one who had given, who had been given one, but who did nothing with it, the master did not say, why don't you have five talents or two talents? He simply wanted to see more from what he had been given. God expects each person to use what gifts, resources, and talents they have and build and improve upon those things. To waste a talent, to bury a talent, to ignore a talent is a sin against God. It is a waste of the gift that God has given you. So people ask, well, you know, what are talents? You know, I don't consider myself to be a talented person. You know, I see this person and, you know, they, they can sing, or this person can teach a Sabbath school lesson, and, and this person plays the piano beautifully, and, you know, this person, they preach wonderful sermons, and, you know, this person is very artistic. We often look at other people and we say, oh, they're very talented. And in fact, the word talent we use in English comes from this biblical story. Because the original meaning of talent was a weight. <laughs> but from this biblical story in English today, we use talent to mean a skill or natural gift or ability. Something that you have. God has given each of us gifts and skills. In Paul's letters in Corinthians... He talks about gifts of the Spirit. Some are preachers. Some are, have the gift of prophecy. Some have the gift of leadership. Some have gifts of, of, of healing. There are many spiritual gifts that are mentioned in the New Testament by Paul. 
And it's very clear that not everyone has the same gift. And not everyone has the same number of gifts. Paul talks about the church as a body and how the body works together. How each person contributes with the gifts and the talents that they have. And that together, the body is able to work and do great things. Not because one member is stronger or better, or one is weaker, but when put together, when combined, they are able to do more and do greater things than they could individually. There are many people who, though, refuse to think that they have any kind of talent or skills. They put themselves down. And in Ellen White's uh, Christ Object Lessons, where she talks about this particular parable, she lists a number of gifts that each one of us have that we need to work on and develop beyond the spiritual gifts which may be limited to one person or to another. First, all of us have a mind. All of us have a mental capacity. And God expects us to, to study and to learn and to develop our mind by the things that we read, by the things that we see, to discover more about the world around us, observing nature, studying God's Word. As we learn and develop more, we are able to do more, to understand more, to explain more. All of us are expected to take advantage of the opportunities we have to learn and to study. The Bible says what? To study and show yourself approved unto God. And Paul commended the Bereans who studied the Word daily for their developing of their mental skills and powers. The power of speech. All of us can talk. Some people like to talk a lot. Some people don't talk very much at all. But all of us have the power to speak. And all of us have the power to, to share and to affect other people by our words. <clears throat> Developing our ability to speak is very important for our ability to witness. Developing some self-confidence being able to speak before other people or to speak one-on-one -on -one to a person. If we develop the ability to speak, we can develop the ability to share what we know and what we have experienced and what we have with people around us. Naturally, those people who are in leadership positions or positions such as pastors or teachers it's even more important for them to develop good abilities of speech. I'm sure all of you have had classes from teachers that it's like, I can't understand <laughs> what he's saying. You know? He talks too fast. <laughs> or, you know, he mumbles and I can't understand what he's saying. You know, he's mumbling up there for everyone's like, huh, huh, huh? <laughs> If you're going to be a pastor or a teacher or leading a Bible study, you have to develop some skills and practice those skills. And the power of speech, developing the ability to speak well in public, to project what you want to say, all of those are skills that can be learned, that can be developed, that can provide a blessing to others. And of course, beyond how we speak, it is what we say. Encouraging words, words of counsel, words of advice, learning when to say the right thing in a tactful way is important. 
All of us have the opportunities to, to listen and to counsel people around us. Friends, co-workers, colleagues, students, parents. People ask us for advice. Probably every week someone asks you for advice about something. Learning how to, to speak and how to share, how to express yourself is very important as a follower of God. We are told that we will be given opportunities to present the truth. And if we have studied, God will be with us and give us the courage to present what we know. Developing the power of speech is a very important gift that each of us has at our disposal. Influence. Each of us affects the people around us. Even if we don't talk to the person, just being near another person, you see how they live, you hear what they say, you, you understand or you learn about them simply through observing them. We all exert an influence on the people around us, whether it's work, or home, or school. In every situation, we are impacting the people who we come in contact with. We are shaping perceptions. People look at us, and they make judgments about us by the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we act. And we are a witness simply by the way we live each day. And so we need to be careful about how we live. We need to be, con be concerned about the image we project. Some people think, oh, it's phony, you know. I should be able to dress any way I like and act any way I like. You know, we live in a free society. Freedom is the most important thing. I can do whatever I want, and I don't need to think about other people. What does Paul say about that when he talks about freedom? He says, it's true. I have freedom. But... I have to think about other people. If my actions taken freely cause another person to stumble, if my actions cause problems for another person, I have responsibility for that. And so, Although we are free to live as we like, we need to consider where we are, the society in which we live. And so, for example, in Japan, you may act and dress a little differently than you might if you were in your home country, because there are different cultural expectations. There are different cultural norms in this country than at home. A very simple example. Shoes, right? You know, in America, I walk into the house, no problem. And actually in Japan, when nobody else is around, I walk into my apartment sometimes. <laughs> but, if I'm visiting a Japanese friend, or if a Japanese friend is at my house and I take off my shoes <laughs> because it's part of the cultural norm here. To do otherwise would, would insult and would anger and cause a friction between me and that person. And that's an example of the situations where we have to be sensitive to local feelings and local culture. And so, as Paul talks about this, our influence, our actions, the way we live, impacts on other people. And all of us 
have the opportunity to impact on people on a daily basis. Another resource that all of us are given is time. Each of us has 24 hours every day. Not a minute more and not a minute less. God gives each of us time. How are you using that time? Are you using the time in a wise and productive way? Or are you wasting time? Are you using the time in a way which doesn't really bring a long-term benefit to yourself? How we manage our time and use our time is a witness to other people as well as something which develops ourselves. And it starts from when we are very young. And as parents and teachers, it's important to instill in children the importance of time. To make them realize that time is a precious thing. That should not be wasted. Too often that's only realized as people get older. <laughs> Oh, I'm young. I have lots of time. No problem. <laughs> but time is a very precious resource. And once it is gone, it can never be recalled. Every moment, every day, God expects us to use in the most profitable, the most beneficial way for ourselves and for other people. And it is a resource that we will be called into account for. How have we used the time which God allotted each one of us? <clears throat> Health. Each of us has been given a body and health by God. Now, it's not the same for every one of us. Uh, some people are naturally healthier than others. Uh, some people's bodies are different shapes and sizes. <coughs> and uh, part of that is based on genetics from what we've received from our ancestors. But all of us have the ability to, to, to develop, to protect, and to improve ourselves physically. While it's true we may have a genetic predisposition one way or another. You can affect your own health by how you take care of yourself, what you eat, what you drink, proper amount of exercise. All of these things have an impact on your body. And we know that it is what you do more than what you are born with that determines your health. If you follow a, a moderate exercise program, if you follow the health principles that uh, we Adventists support, uh, no alcohol, no smoking, uh, a, a vegetarian diet, Adventists, the average Adventist lives five to ten years longer in America, depending on how many of these principles they follow faithfully. Your choices about your lifestyle affect your health. And God expects us to use the body that He gave us in the most positive way. Paul talks about it, our body as what? The temple. A temple of God. And we look at people who are professional athletes, and often the most successful are very, very careful about their body. I like American football, and there are some American football players who are very good players, who've had very long careers, and often when you 
read interviews with them, some interesting things come out. Often these players who have played the longest and most successful, they don't drink or drink very little. They don't smoke. Some of them are vegetarians. <laughs> and you think, oh, football players, they have to be so big and strong, and you know, how can they bulk up with only vegetables? And, but they do. It is possible to follow a very healthy lifestyle and still develop in that way, to build up strength and muscle. You don't have to rely on unhealthy foods to develop physically. All of us are given a body that God expects us to, to honor by what we eat and what we drink. What the Bible says, what? whatever we do, do to the glory of God. Our temple is a body, and how we take care of that, we will be called to account for someday. Another talent, or another gift, that we all receive, in varying degrees, is money. Now, we all don't have the same amount of money. But God provides us with money to varying levels, depending on our, our work and our education, the experiences that we have. God blesses us in a material way. And God expects us to use the money that He gives us in a wise, profitable, and beneficial way not just to ourselves, but to other people. And when we talk about stewardship related to money, of course, tithes and offerings are important, part of that. We need to support the work of God by regular giving and regular contributions. But beyond that, we need to be wise with how we handle and how we manage the money that we have. We live in a very materialistic world today in most Western countries and here in Japan. People are concerned with appearances, how they dress, the cars that they have, the house that they have, the bags that they have, the watch that they're wearing, the ties that they buy. Many people are very conscious of brand names and wanting to have these good things. As Christians, we need to be wise with how we manage our money. We need to use money in a way which will benefit ourselves and also benefit others. We must be generous to others. When people are in need, we have an when we have an opportunity to help, we need to willingly reach out and provide for those who we can help that we see around us. What did Jesus say in that other parable, right? Uh, I was hungry, and you did not feed me. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. We have a responsibility to the people around us and the society in which we live to provide for them when we have the opportunity and the chance. God has given us money in different levels, and we will be judged on how we use the money that we have. With all of the gifts that God has given us, there is a very important principle that we find in the parable that Jesus told. That if we use what God has given us, it will expand. It will grow. It will develop. Each of the servants who put the talents to use, each of these men who used the money that was given them, had more in the long run. If we use the gifts and talents that God provides, if we apply ourselves, if, you, if we develop each of these things, if we do whatever we can with all of our might, asking the Spirit to be with us and to guide us and direct us as we use these things, God will 
build up and increase the talents and skills that we have. When I first came to Japan, I had never really preached. I, Of course, I was a teacher in the U.S., so I gave lectures and occasionally gave presentations, but I hadn't really... I hadn't really been a preacher before I came to Japan. And when I came here, I wasn't really expecting to be a preacher. I was expecting to be an English teacher. <laughs> and when I got to Osaka, and uh, we sat down for orientations, like, oh yes, uh, yes, all of the teachers have to preach. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't that excited about it, to be honest. It's like, oh, you know, having to get up a bunch of, in front of a bunch of people. and Some of the people were trained pastors. Uh, at that time, we had several people who were uh, theology graduates. Uh, one guy was had his master's in theology. He was kind of our local pastor. I was like a little self-conscious. Oh, you know, if I get up and preach, and this guy, he's going to be evaluating me. Oh, you know, Mark, he's not really following good homiletics. Or, oh, his sermon is so disorganized. And don't understand what he's trying to say. But, even though I had reservations, I, I took the task, and I applied myself. And I think that because of my willingness to, to apply myself, God blessed me and uh, has made it a very positive experience over the years that I've been here. God will bless you and build up whatever talent that you have if you're willing to use it. Do not be like the person who buried your talent because... The opposite is also true. For the person who applies themselves, the talent grows. But the person who buries their talent, the talent disappears and is taken away. My father is, or was, a music teacher for many years. He's very musical. He plays many instruments has an ear for music, composes music. And um, my, uh, my family has a lot of musical talent. My grandfather also uh, played music by ear. Never studied music, but you know he would just sit down and play the organ or piano. He had an ear for music. And so I inherited that talent from my grandfather and from my father. And uh, I've always liked music, and from when I was very young, I sang and played instruments, and, and because of that, I feel that God has blessed me, and I'm able to, to do all of these things much better now than when I was a young child. On the other hand, my younger brother has done nothing. <laughs> uh, when we were children, he sang a little bit in choirs, and sometimes he and I would sing together. And uh, he played the guitar a little bit when he was a kid as well, but uh, after a while he got tired, like, oh, I don't have time for this, or I, I don't really want to do this. And so today, he rarely sings, and he doesn't play any instruments today like I do. We both were born into the same situation. We both had the same opportunity to develop and to to have this natural talent and gift that was passed down to us by our father and grandfather. And yet today, he do, he's done nothing with it, and I've developed it and use it for my own blessing and for blessings of others. If you don't use what you are given, it disappears. I teach English. And some of my students are like, oh, you know, I, I, was, I lived in the U.S. for two or three years, and my English got really, uh, really, really good, but I'm worried if I don't use my English, it will disappear. And it's true. If you don't practice, if you don't apply yourself, skills do not improve. 
If you fail to apply yourself, if you don't study, if you don't practice, skills do not go up. They go down. And even for a short while, I played the guitar. I've played many years. But if I don't play for a few weeks, if I'm on vacation and I don't play, and I come back and I start playing, I, I recognize the difference. If we fail to use the talents and skills that God has provided for us, they will be taken away. And so my prayer this morning is that each one of you, in whichever way you can, use the talents that you have. Apply yourself every day. Use talents in ways that you've never tried before. Sometimes people have hidden talents that they only learn through experiment. Be willing to try something new and different. You may discover a talent that has been buried. Because none of us wants to face God in the end and face judgment for wasting the skills and opportunities that we have had. None of us wants to be cast out. <laughs> it is my prayer that all of us will be praised as good and faithful servants and invited in to share in the reward of the Lord.